From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 150, recorded on April 17th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today, right here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, hello Daniel. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, everybody. I, you know, I, you know, I I'm re- saying hello to you. I have to revise. Then I say hello to Daniel, and then you can say hello to Daniel. But it's Let's fun. try this again. <laughs> no, but you know, I've noticed that when I like go into a room, and I apparently I say that, I realize, hello, everybody. You know, just a friendly guy. It reminds me of TWIP. Brings back you know, fond memories. We try and be friendly. <laughs> But Daniel's here today. He's visiting the medical yes, he's center. Live. He's visiting the Columbia University. Um, what's the guy's name? Irv- Irv- Irving. Irving Medical Center, and we are in the Columbia University Vagilos College of Physicians and Surgeons. Correct. How about that? That's right. <laughs> Amazing. It's, it's getting complicated. It truly is. We have a follow up email, and follow up means it has to do with the last episode. Yes. From Jason, who writes, Hi, Vincent and Dick. So this is these are from the old days when I used to call Dixon Dick and before Daniel was here. This is pre Daniel? It's not but, but but not but not really. And I you know, I read this and of course they leave me out. So for a little <laughs> while I feel a little bit hurt. But then I, I did re- <laughs> I did Aww. I'm sensitive. Jason, but, you heard but his then feeling. I but then I realized, right, this is when we had Shivong, so I was sort of stepping back a little <laughs> bit. Right. And I think maybe I mentioned something about like suicide in Nepal from, you know, certain agrochemicals. But otherwise right. I really <laughs> actually you two discussed the paper. Paper, maybe. yeah. Uh, my name is Jason Rohr, and I study various parasites of humans and wildlife. I wanted to thank you for covering our recently published work on This Week in Parasitism. Agrochemicals increase risk of human schistosomiasis. Remember we did that last time, Dixon? I do remember that. It was great. A lot of fun to listen to. And, Dick, we will be sure to mention vertical farming as a viable option for increasing food production and reducing the adverse effects of agrochemicals in the future. Thanks again. Jason is a professor at the University of South Florida. Thank you, Jason. I wonder where that is, Dixon. Do you know? Uh, I believe it's in the southern part of Florida. You're so funny. <laughs> it's in Tampa. That's not the southern part. It says Tampa. I know. That's it's interesting because it's sort of the mid-range of Florida. Dixon, can you take the next one? Sure. Uh, Johnny writes, hello, Twipsters. I'm a longtime Twixt listener, first-time writer. In Twip 149, Professor Yellow said that every virus gets in the CNS Every virus that gets in the CNS is a mistake. Seems to me that the rabies virus benefits from being in the CNS. The violent movements, uncontrolled excitement, confusion, and other behavioral changes caused by the inflammation of the brain makes the infected animal more likely to bite and infect other animals. Hydrophobia prevents diluting the virus load in saliva. I assume the hydrophobia is also at least partially caused by the brain inflammation. Yanni, pronounced Yanni, and I think I was right, a software developer from Finland. I said every human virus ah. that gets in the CNS is a mistake because humans don't transmit rabies to each other. No, For dogs, absolutely. They go in raccoons and right. bats, whoever else gets animals. So we're an accidental host. But not humans. And Daniel, can you take Rebecca's? Rebecca writes, Dear Twip Friends, I've been enjoying your podcast for many months now, even though I have no medical knowledge. In fact, I like to tell people that I am the wrong kind of doctor. (laughs) Rather, fewer people have the need for an ecologist than an MD. Uh, I I would stop right there and say absolutely wrong. (laughs) I actually think the world is in need of many more ecologists. Totally agree. (laughs) Um, and less MDs. Sorry. (laughs) This doesn't prevent my enjoyment of the podcast as the diagnosis and treatment of parasites is as fascinating as their ecology. Mm. I was very interested to hear the discussion in episode 149 about the use of agrochemicals. I felt that I couldn't let one assertion go unchallenged, Uh that commercial farmers care only about profit. Mm. Here, here, I jumped in and said that that was a little cynical (laughs) of you guys. Um, (laughs) Have you 
ever known someone go into farming because they think it's a lucrative business? Yeah, right, right. My experience is that they farm despite the level of profit rather than because of it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Ad- agrochemicals are used for many reasons, and profit is just one of them. One factor is that people like you and me choose and expect cheap food. And as a society, we also don't currently possess the knowledge and technology to feed the global population without the use of chemicals. If we want to change this, we all have the power to choose more sustainable diets. I therefore Mm -hmm. prefer that we first look um, a little at our own behavior before putting all the blame on others. You seem very knowledgeable of topics related to food production, (laughs) so I am sure that you're aware of the land sharing versus land sparing debate. (laughs) Your listeners, however, may not be, and I think it is an important one to be familiar with when discussing the use of agrochemicals. I'm therefore sharing a link um, that they may enjoy, and there's a link here. The challenge of building a sustainable food system is extremely complex, and I am pleased to see it being explored. I look forward to future episodes and hope to hear more about your sailing adventures as well. Best wishes, Rebecca. Uh, That's great. Um, Let me just add something here, and that is that it depends on what you're farming as to whether or not you're going to make a profit. Uh, I spent a lot of time fishing up in Alberta, for instance, and I heard repeatedly that the hay farmers of Alberta have these huge hay farms, and they're million-dollar farms, basically. So farmers up there do very, very well, but they, they they make one product. That's it. Hey, and that's all they do. Mm. Wheat farmers do very well also, and so do corn farmers. But little dirt farmers on a 2,000 acre farm, they don't do well at all. So, But there are fewer and fewer and fewer of those people. So what's really happening is that farming is becoming a large industrial process for soybeans and corn and a few other big products. And uh, everybody else you know, sort of has to scramble in order to make ends meet. And I agree. The majority of people make ends meet by uh, simply loving the the act of farming, whereas the big industrial complexes are out for uh, as much as they can get. So we should distinguish between those two groups. Did you want to – she brought up this land sharing versus land sparing debate. Did you want to – I don't know much about it, to be honest. So I would like to read about it first before I say anything that, that it might place me at risk for another email <laughs> with barbed hooks. <laughs> Well, I think um, maybe Rebecca is not aware of vertical farming because she talks about us having to um, choose more sustainable diets. But it seems to me yeah. if, if you farm indoors, you can right. still choose to eat what you Sure, eat. there are alternatives uh, all the way through. That's absolutely true. So, Rebecca, check out microbe.tv slash urban agriculture. And Dixon has 29 podcasts now. Yep. on, uh, and we're working on another one right now. As we indoor speak. farming. That's right. Which spares the land, right? Exactly, exactly. That brings us to a case report, which we last did last month, which was March. Now, Daniel, do you remember what the last case report was? <laughs> you know, I, I do, because I was actually doing a presentation Thursday. I did a couple of presentations on Thursday morning. First, it was to the General Clinical ID Division at 1130. I did one to the uh, Columbia Stem Cell Initiative, but the clinical one, I actually included this case as one of the cases in my themed presentation. So uh, I I actually remember. <laughs> no, it was I, quite, I, also quite fond, well I also fondly remember this gentleman because it was only very recently that I saw him right. when I was down there in Panama. Indeed. And uh, this was a 31-year-old um, man who had an ulcer on his left leg, which was about four centimeters in diameter. With, as I described, raised raised borders, uh, surrounding area that was hard and different in color, but this was not undermined. He had described the evolution as it starting as a bump, slowly enlarging, ulcerating, and then now he's had an ulcer for about a month. Uh, healthy individual, no prior medical problems, does report diabetes in his mother. He um, works in a field with his machete. Uh, doing some sort of basic farming, as we discussed. He lives with his family. A um, little bit of social drinking, a little bit of smoking. I think he smokes two cigarettes a day is what we what he actually told me. Um, he lives in this isolated village on um, an island in this archipelago. Uh, he's a member of the Nebe, which is an indigenous pre-Columbian um, tribe in this area of Panama. Um, he really feels well. 
He's living his life, lots of insects, lots of animals. He's in one of these homes, and they have these raised slat floors. And there's a little bit of a gap between the slats. And if I mention, because this way, if the particularly the children will sometimes have accidents in the house, this way you can just sort of wash it off and sweep it, mm. and things fall between the slats. Mm. Um, that's an interesting approach. Um, the um, over water toilets is what they use, right? Um, no fevers, normal blood pressure. And when we look at it, pretty much we see the ulcer that was described. It was not tender. We pushed around. He hadn't reported any pain. The base of the ulcer was red. There was no purulent material. The border was raised. And you could see an area about two centimeters sort of um, around the lesion where there was a slight difference in color. I'll say a, a redness relative to his normal skin color. Um, it was not undermined, as we said again. And this area felt hard. There was no scab. And then we had done a dermoscopic examination. And this showed erythema, uh, small uh, yellowish teardrops, small white starbursts. And I, I, really, I probably mentioned at this point. So when I'm seeing this gentleman, I'm working with this organization called Floating Doctors. And um, I know when I worked with Femeric, I'd mentioned a little bit about them. So Floating Doctors is this organization that a guy, Ben Labrat from California, mm. an American started a number of years ago. And he originally rebuilt a large vessel and started his medical mission work, I guess I will say, um, when there were a lot of troubles in Haiti. You know, fortunately, all those troubles have now been resolved. But no. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, this was back when there had been, you know, the natural disaster, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, but now he has actually created this organization, um, which is now based in Panama. And they go out to all these places, and they actually medical students, a lot of other, even non-medical volunteers will be part of these mm -hmm. missions, and they go every three months to these villages, have these wonderful relationships with the local individuals, a tremendous organization to work with. And so when I'm down there, um, and I've gone with them now a couple times, and this will probably be a regular gig for me, is I go and I do these things, well, nice. some education down there. Um, so just a shout out to Floating Doctors doing some great work down there, and through working with them, I came to meet this young man. Right. Okay, we had 12 guesses. Wow. David P. writes, Dear hosts, I believe the 31-year-old man from Panama suffering from an ulcer on his leg has contracted a case of cutaneous leishmaniasis from the protozoan parasite Leishmania brasiliensis or Leishmania panamanensis. The man likely contracted this parasite from a local sandfly in his outdoor work in the field. The slow gr growth rate of the ulcerated lesion from a small papular bump to its current size of four centimeters over a month fits the diagnosis quite nicely. And Daniel's description of the dermoscopic features of the lesion helps seal the diagnosis. Upon Googling the features of a cutaneous ulcer, I came across a paper that described this patient's results to a word, erythematous papular <laughs> initial lesion and yellow tears. Thank you once again for the informative and entertaining podcast. David sends a picture. Is is uh, I don't know where he got it from, but if oh yeah, if you could let us know, I, David P. That's uh, I like this. It's great. Yeah, Can you no, see that over here. on your yep. screen? I do, I do. Yep, I like that. Dixon. Peter writes. And now I'm going to mispronounce this. A shower day? No, a shared. <laughs> You know, you might need the mnemonic every time, or what is it, the French, pronunciation guide? I have a no, French last Irish. name, but it's Irish. It's, it's not a, it's Irish. Not oh, I stand. I sit corrected. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. A shared. A shared twip. But that's my pronunciation. It could be very wrong. Well, I'll go for you. A shared. A shared twip. Daniel might know. He's been there. That's right. He's also Irish. If you would like some pointers <laughs> in the pronunciation of a shared, <laughs> <laughs> your former president had a good go, as seen in this video recorded at Souter University at about two meters. Minutes. <laughs> two minutes, 16 seconds. Boy, Dixon, you're a funny guy. <laughs> uh, that, wasn't a, that was not an attempt at humor, trust me. To investigate this case study, I was joined by Gwyn Despler... <laughs> I'm, I'm having a we, we've switched roles. Normally, I struggle through pronunciation. <laughs> so, Gwen is Lipper and Rachel Byrne. Glenn D and Rachel B. Is Dr. Griffin trying to trick us? This was our first thoughts after hearing the case study. It's definitely sounded like cutaneous leishmania, which was also the correct diagnosis of a very recent case study on TWIP. 
The literature we consult has now benefited from the addition of Forgotten People, Forgotten Diseases by Peter Hotez, which I was lucky to win from TWIV. Thanks again. Consulting that, we read the early stages of cutaneous leishmania resemble those of bru- Buruli ulcer, Buruli ulcer, which is on the rise, by the way, in Australia, I just read. Parasitic Diseases 6th Edition also warns about confusion with leprosy. However, the small yellowish teardrops, as well as white starbursts, appear more consistent with cutaneous leishmania. For example, in this 2017 paper, and she lists a reference there, Panama and insect bites also agree with leishmania. So, with some hesitancy, we will go with cutaneous leishmania again to confirm it it is leishmania and identify it to species level, we would carry out PCR. Also important as treatment will be species dependent as some species in Latin America may spread to the mucous membrane. When you last spoke of leishmania, you spoke of the stigma associated with CL um, right, infection. Hotez's book contains the line for instance in Afghanistan, even though CL is not transmitted by contact infection between people, it requires the sandfly vector. Mothers with CL are prevented from touching their children. How terribly sad and unnecessarily cruel. Highlights the importance of educational tools like TWIP. Slain Peter Stewart. Slain. Did you slay him? <laughs> I did not. Daniel. Chris writes, Hello, hosts. This week was a nice and easy one, so I didn't feel the need to look up the (laughs) symptoms for the answer. I believe the man has cutaneous leishmaniasis because of the symptoms. Also, once Daniel mentioned the yellow teardrops, I became curious and Googled that and found that um, it occurs in 41.7% of dermoscopic examinations and the white starbursts appear 60.4% of the time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Lastly, it is a sunny 37 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit here in central Jersey with rain scheduled for this week. Warm regards from an aspiring parasitologist, oh, Chris. Excellent. Mm. Glad we could inspire you. Eric writes, dear TWIP hosts, from what I learned in episode 147, I believe that Dr. Griffin's patient has cutaneous leishmaniasis. This review reports that Leishmania panamanensis is the most prevalent species in Panama, as its name suggests, and I'm guessing the patient acquired the species. I'm interested to hear about this case was managed. The teardrops and starbursts Dr. Griffin saw with his dermoscope sounded at first pass like the organisms or something they secrete. I was probably thinking about Leishman Donovan bodies, but now I know that a dermoscope doesn't magnify to the level of signal cells. A quick search yielded me at least three case series of old world cutaneous Leishmaniasis from Spain, Iran, and Turkey describing these phenomena as areas of rapidly proliferating host skin cells. Cool. Cheers, Eric, at the David, David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. That's and nice. He had an asterisk on, yeah, as yeah. its name suggests, and he writes, one cannot assume a species' scientific name is meaningful. There are many cases mm-hmm. where the author of a new species used the wrong location to create the species' scientific name. Furthermore, Taxonomic rules prohibit changing a scientific name once published to avoid confusion. Hmm. Only when someone finds a scientific reason to redefine the species can names be reassigned. Random example, the mussel species Isonomen californicum, Conrad 1837, is only found in Hawaii, (laughs) but the species name has been around since 1837, I surmise. Very good. Dixon, you are next. I am. Swellen writes first. Sue Ellen, remember she told us. Swellen. Sue yeah. Ellen. Sue Ellen. Swellen. <laughs> <laughs> Sue Ellen. <clears throat> we just want to make sure we got to be nice to Dixon again because apparently oh, we've okay. been so nice it's, lately that that has fallen out of as, favor. As long so as I'm having a rough day, you might as well just keep it coming <laughs> while he's down. <laughs> Did you need a ride home? <laughs> I'm apparently not at this point. <laughs> Sue Ellen writes. First, let me tell you how super happy I was when I heard this case. I actually was immediately able to come up with a diagnosis in my head without referring to Parasitic Diseases 6th Edition or Dr. Google. That means that I'm actually retaining some of the great material I get from TWIP. (laughs) My top-of-mind diagnosis was cutaneous leishmaniasis because I remembered that it causes a lesion of the size mentioned in the case. But I also remember that this was the diagnosis for a case just a couple of episodes ago. 
Still, it seemed to fit the facts of the case, and although I did search both PD 6th edition and Dr. Google, I was not able to find another parasitic diseases that fit the case so well. Other possibilities, I researched guinea worm, which this does cause an ulcer on the foot, but it is now both very rare and confined to a few countries in Africa, so not a good candidate. Toxicara, this produces those serpiginous lesions, but with this patient, this, but this patient does not have. So in the end, I decided to go with CL, cutaneous leishmaniasis, because it seemed to fit the case best. Lauren writes, Dear Vincent and TWIP crew, thank you for your enthusiasm to share science. Case study for TWIP 149, <clears throat> 31-year-old man with ulcer on his leg. My guess is cutaneous leash mania, panamanensis, mid-stage. This is based on that it sounds like the case study from TWIP 146 of the 27-year-old lawyer with ulcer from New York. And Daniel, it's now back for, is, down, is now back from Panama. Mid-stage because yellow droplets are early stage and the white starbursts are late stage. Huh. Sorry, I did not um, have a well-written-out diagnostic or treatment plan to suggest this time. I just wanted to participate in the case study. <laughs> Lauren from sunny San Diego. Great. And may I add something here? Mm -hmm. It's panamensis. It's not panamensis. It's panamensis. Everybody's writing panamensis. No, no, no. It's panamensis. It's spelled P-A-N-A-M-E-N-S-I-S. Well, here it's panamensis. We actually, early on, it was written panamensis. I understand, right? but it's actually panamensis. panamensis. I, I, You're right. It is written correctly, and I am misspeaking, and you should talk about misspeaking, young man. <laughs> exactly. You know, today, today I thought I'd just day. throw a little dart back in your jaw. There was direction. actually the first person, <laughs> David, wrote panamensis. I know, I know, I know. But and he's a parasitology student at Tufts. Well, so We're going to have to correct him on that one. Sorry about that. Panamensis. 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 Leishmania panamensis. Patricio it writes. is panamensis. You're right. Why are you reading another one? You want to read another one? Sure. Go ahead. But I didn't just. It's not your turn, man. <laughs> <laughs> you can read it. It's fine. Patricio writes Hi, based on the description of the ulcer and the place of living, I presume it is a case of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Best, Patricio. Thanks. Alice writes Greetings, doctors of TWIP. My name is Kay Alice Fox, and I am a lab manager technician to a fish and wildlife disease genetics lab at SUNY ESF <sighs> in Syracuse, New York. Cool. I've been listening to your podcast since last September when I took a parasitology course to learn more about the parasites mm -hmm. I am working on in the lab. My background is actually plants, so this was new and fascinating territory for me. I am finally all caught up with the podcast, <laughs> which I have been voraciously devouring during many long hours of running PCR, DNA sequencing, <laughs> and bacterial cloning of various wildlife and their assorted parasites. Mm. Now that I am all caught up, I thought I'd give my diagnosis for number 149's case of the 31-year northern Panamanian with Leishmania. This otherwise healthy man presents with a 4-centimeter painless reddish, etc. We don't have to repeat that. No. Leishmania is a protozoan parasite that is transmitted through infected female sandfly bites. Leishmaniasis, cutaneous leishmaniasis, most commonly presented form characterized by skin lesions that develop over several weeks. The sores are usually painless unless they become infected and take a long time to heal. Given he is in northern Panama near Costa Rica, this is a new world species of leishmania of either El Mexicano or El Brasiliensis species complex. Diagnosis is by microscopy of skin lesion samples. PCR could also be run. Treatment depends on several factors, including species, geographic area, and the lesion progression. In general, healing is the lesion is key. Cryotherapy, thermotherapy, and topical <laughs> application of paromomycin are suggested on the CDC page. Systemically speaking, there are a few options for the New World Leishmania, including pentostam, amphotericin, miltefacine, listed to be affected against effective against three New World species, and the azoles, keto ketoconazole, fluconazole, which have, been, have mixed results, but could work for our Panamanian. I have really enjoyed exploring this fascinating field for your podcast and look forward to hearing your voices through my earbuds during many more hours of running PCR. <laughs> Cheers, Alice. Daniel. Rhonda, right. So we're, we're changing the swing. We are. You jumped in. Right? We so are. now we're going, we are. We're going here. Uh, yeah, that's right. Clockwise. Yeah, that's right. Rhonda writes, greetings to all the TWIP team. 
My name is Rhonda, and I work in a clinical microbiology lab in Washington State. I think cutaneous leishmaniasis is likely the cause of this patient's ulcers. Right. Um, also, Central America is an endemic region <clears throat> containing leishmania. The dermoscopic exam also seems to fit the picture of cutaneous leishmaniasis, although I must admit I had to consult Google. I have just recently <laughs> discovered your podcast and I've been working my way through the backlog. Keep up the good work. I hope you never stop. Great. So do we. <laughs> Elliot writes, Stranger in a Strange Land, TWIP case number 149. Hi, my name is Elliot, and I'm an avid listener to TWIP, TWIV, as well as TWIM. I'm a current student with double major epidemiology and biochem. I decided to do some research on this young man in northern Panama on the border with Costa Rica. I'm going to hazard a guess that the diagnosis of hookworms, specifically Ancelostoma or Duodenale family, the man is 31 years old, uh, who works in the sugarcane an extremely dangerous profession. Now the ulcer could have aroused, aroused from a lo- laceration. from a laceration from the equipment used in cutting the cane. However, I remember how you stated that it started as a small papule, which could be the penetration site of the hookworm. Most likely he picked it up from kneeling in the tainted soil that they were using to fertilize the cane fields without proper ways of purifying the soil. The light smoking and drinking could have helped break down his immune system and allowed the small papule to turn into a full, fully ulcer. The redness around the wound could be early signs of infection with blood poisoning due to lack of proper sanitary conditions, which explains why his blood pressure is slightly elevated. This also points to the arrhythmia. Now for the blood smear. Uh, showed signs of yellow tear drops, which could have been the pockets of live larvae before they burrow into the bloodstream, eventually ending up in the intestinal tract. If I was the physician, I would have ran a stool sample. However, in a village like this, it may not have been possible. So I would try a three-day dose of the anti-helminthic drug family, as these are relatively harmless and are very effective most often. Depending on iron levels or presentation of any anemia, I would also prescribe a month's worth of iron supplements as well. I will keep trying different cases because I find these subjects extremely satisfying to the brain and my family and and my favorite thing to study. Thank you guys very much and have an awesome week. Cool. Well, there was a different guess. There was a very different guess. Dylan writes, G'day Twippers. Hopefully I'm not too late. My name is Dylan. I'm currently finishing off my last semester of undergrad at the University of Queensland, Uh hopefully going on to study parasitology in my honors. Cool. I'm a recent listener to TWIP, and the podcasts are so enjoyable to listen to on my daily train rides. In terms of the case study for TWIP 149, my guess is leishmaniasis, more specifically cutaneous leishmaniasis. When the ulcer on the leg was mentioned and instantly thought of a diptera vector in Google to see what was found in Panama, quite a few articles came up with sand flies being quite prominent. And since they are a well-known vector of leishmania, I instantly jumped on that. Looking further into the symptoms, I found that erythema is always found with cutaneous leishmaniasis, while teardrop structures and white starburst patterns are found in 42% and 8.6% of dermoscopic examinations. Respectively, these findings really support my idea of the parasitic infection being a Leishmania protozoa. Keep up the great and super interesting podcasts. We got one more. Conrad writes, Dear TWIP team, I'm a new listener, an undergraduate interested in global health, and I'm looking forward to going through the TWIP and other backlogs. I want to jump right in with an attempt at the case diagnosis for the March episode, hoping this email doesn't come too late. The patient is in generally good health, suggesting that the ulcer is not a sign of immunodeficiency or of a systemic infection. The ulcer also is painless, has no scab, and developed over time from a small bump or nodule. This is characteristic of localized cutaneous leishmaniasis caused by protozoans of the genus Leishmania, which are endemic throughout much of South and Central America, Asia, and Africa. The size of the ulcer within the expected size range for cutaneous leishmaniasis and, although I have no dermatology pathology knowledge the redness starburst patterns and tear like teardrop like structures observed on dermoscopy match known dermoscopic features of cutaneous leishmaniasis and we get a reference there phlebotamine sand flies transmit the parasite to the definitive host human or other vertebrate the parasite works in the field so he may well have encountered the sand fly on the job 
Since his home is exposed to the air, he may also have been exposed while sleeping. Unlike more severe forms of leishmaniasis, most notably visceral, the patient shouldn't be in serious danger. The ulcer should heal by itself after some time. Antiparasitic medications that are effective against leishmaniasis are often toxic. If the ulcer isn't causing serious distress, monitoring with no active treatment may be the best option. Thank you for the educational and engaging podcast. Conrad Fondry, University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh. And cool. Then he's got a reference there for us on Excellent. clinical and dermoscopic evaluation of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Exactly. All right. We had 11 leishmania and one hookworm. We did. <laughs> <laughs> what was your guess, Dixon? Uh, my guess was uh, I would side with the majority vote on this one. Cutaneous leishmaniasis sounds very reasonable indeed. Panamensis. <laughs> Panamensis. <laughs> Did that no, you'd have to do a you'd have to do a PCR to really find out which one PCR, this was. Huh? Yeah, you'd have to actually do some genetics, and uh, it really doesn't matter as long as it's clinic it's clinically localized to the skin. If it should disappear and then suddenly metastasize to a mucocutaneous mm-hmm. junction, however, then you would be forced to to reinforce your diagnosis of uh, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. But that would be that could come out in the uh, the PCR diagnosis. That's my that's my guess. I I like that. Um, I don't it, think that the fanciful trip of through the life cycle of Ancelastomodontal was. I don't mean to belittle the response, but it was um, somewhat contrived because a lot of the things that were said in the uh, the little teardrops and things like this larvae and things those those are not a characteristic of a hookworm infection at any level, including the papule eroding into an ulcer and things like this, that that, that just doesn't exist in hookworm. Mm-hmm. So I'm sorry to say that uh, maybe the sixth edition of uh, parasitic diseases would be a good idea for that one and forget the other 11 because <laughs> he has the most to learn from, um, you know, just distinguishing between these uh, clinical conditions. Yeah, I was. I have to say I was really um... – Glad when we got all these responses. I like the way people thought it through. Yeah, absolutely. and um, and I think the level we're trying to achieve, hopefully, is that people don't necessarily have to Google, but they can say, "Oh, I I remember this case, and and there are features here that I remember." And you know, because in the you know when you're out there in the field seeing patients, right? You're not you're not Googling every case. The hope is you're getting yeah. to a level where. Yeah. When a case presents to you, you say, "Okay, let's see here. We have an ulcer, and what were the exciting features?" When I when I present these, a lot of times I actually highlight in red, you know, so the the fact that it's it's painless, the ulcer is painless, yeah, right. The duration has been there for about a month. It's not underlined, right? Undermined, and that's important. Mm-hmm. When you go to the edge of the lesion, if you try to take a Q tip in a Borrelli ulcer, mm. um, you know, you're actually gonna get a put a q-tip it's going to go under it's actually quite Oof. disturbing and uh, gross i'll uh, you know, say gross actually to be honest right, right. where this has a really fixed border and then that induration that's actually where the parasites are this we talked about a two centimeter area around the ulcer um you know you go looking in the middle of that ulcer you're not going to find the leishmania parsets but if you go in this tissue around that's where you're you're going to find them right um a couple features I'll say about sort of this group of cases that I'm presenting now is one is I like to pick a geographical locale, get people kind of used to it, right? So now we're in, we're yep. in Panama right yep. now. We're going to yep. be there for a few episodes. The other is um, we're limiting our resources. As I mentioned we, to get to this <laughs> village, right? We had to travel hours by boat. We're soaked, and then we 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 head up this river. And now we're in this this limited you know resource area. Now we're limited on our resources as well. So you know we don't have PCR. Um, we're not going to be back in this village for a few months. So we're going to have to try to work with what we have. And one of the things I'm introducing, and you're going to see it again in the case I present today, is this dermoscope. I mean, what what is a dermoscope? And I actually mm-hmm. probably should have brought one to show you guys, but maybe it's better that I didn't because I'll describe it to you the way I did. And this is a special device that actually allows you to see into the skin, and it attaches onto a an iPhone. I have an older iPhone that yeah. I got hold of. Mm. And the great thing, a couple of things. One is you can magnify to about tenfold. So that's important to think about. We're about tenfold magnification. We're not down to a single cellular level. So, mm. so we're seeing structures that might be as described, cellular proliferative um, mm-hmm. responses, et cetera. Um, but we're not actually seeing the parasites. But 
the nice thing is people are starting to study these diseases and using a dermoscope, you can take a clinical suspicion and raise it to a higher level. Say, mm. am I seeing dermoscopic features that would be consistent with what I'm concerned about here? Um, what we're lacking is this, this issue of PCR. And I brought this up and discussed with a few clinicians when I was down there in Panama, because we would all like to know, those of us who've read sixth edition, parasitic diseases, is this a species, subspecies, mm -hmm. that might metastasize and cause mucocutaneous right. disease? And we, we actually list in our book, and I talk about this in my lectures, that panamanensis is described in the literature as one that can have that potential. Mm -hmm. But I suspect it's a much lower incidence than um, people describe in the literature for several reasons. I'll say one is I talked to these physicians who've been practicing in these areas for years and they never see mucocutaneous. It's a, not something mm -hmm. you see very commonly in Panama. Um, I suspect that when you get a 1%, 5%, 10%, you're saying people that were so severe, it went on for so long that they finally actually came to be seen at a major center, like let's say city of Panama, and then you're taking a percentage of that severe manifestation. Oh, so yeah. um, in general, in these remote villages, we we say it's very unlikely it's gonna become mucocutaneous, and we're treating it as a low likelihood for mucocutaneous spread. So we, we don't have that PCR, which we would love in a more resource rich area to definitively say, you know, no, we don't have to worry about that. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, how do we, how do we, uh, so the diagnosis we're making here is basically everything I gave for mm -hmm. people. We have mm -hmm. the clinical presentation. We have, and uh, I like David P's pictures of the starburst Beautiful, and the yeah. teardrops, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, Put them in the show notes. Yeah, actually, that would be. Yeah, why don't you do that, great. Dixon? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, when I say let's, it's an authorial let's. Authorial. <laughs> That's, That's right. the royal V with you <laughs> the royal the work, Benson, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's okay. Yeah, the pictures are very nice. I wonder where they came from. And I think some of the emails people got us at the, you know, you're acquiring this through the sand, through the bite of a sand fly. And I always make yeah. the point, it's a sand, not a beach fly. That's right. So you could be up at 8,000 feet in the Andes and people are getting bitten by sand flies, not beach flies, and getting different um, infections, leishmaniasis mm -hmm. uh, in particular, from these beautiful little fragile um, vectors. Um, and then they can come and bite, and not only people, but also uh, there's a dog there in Panama we're trying to treat with topical azoles, who I worry is getting bitten, and then you know the sand flies are then spreading it to other yeah. people and other animals. I'd like to quote from our book just to clarify an issue here. It's not just the female the sand fly that bites, uh, the male fly bites as well. They both feed on blood, so they both have the option of transmitting this infection. Unlike mosquitoes for malaria, for instance, that only the female bites to, to obtain blood for egg production. These uh, flies actually feed on blood, so that's their food. And the female mosquito, only about 1% are double biters, there right? There you go. So it's not even all right. the females. So it's oh, very right. different. Here you've got yeah. males, females. That's yeah. right. And you know, Dixon, there are some mosquitoes that do not take blood. At all. At all. That's correct. They just live on sap. Well, they all live on sap. That's the point. Every single female mosquito and, they, and male, the they live on sap. just for the egg But the these eggs production. Are, special mosquitoes, even the females make eggs on oh, sap. Uh, that's, that's true. That it's is very amazing. True. That is very true. If only all mosquitoes were just <laughs> sap suckers, right? Well, <laughs> if we could uh, meet with them on a daily basis, perhaps we could convince them otherwise. But right now, we've got some blood suckers. So now, care. Daniel, you had all the information that we had to make your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But of course you had many years of experience, mm -hmm. which we do not have. And it was actually nice because it wasn't just, it wasn't just me by myself here. So a few of us kind of got together mm -hmm. and, and actually I was introducing the dermoscopy um, to this setting and sort of demonstrating how it could be used. Um, and I think that's something they'll use um, more in the future. So we had the diagnosis. Now the next question we get to, I mean, we have, we've made the diagnosis as much, you know, with the level of surgery we can. Yeah. So how do you treat? That's right. And so, you know, one of the things I love about going to places, I love asking people, you know, well, what, mm -hmm. do you, what do people here do? What, what is the approach? And there were some interesting approaches. One of the things um, they do, and I, and I always love to take my initial reaction or take the initial reaction people have to the local therapies and say, okay, should, is it justifiable that we have that reaction? And so one of the first things they'll do is they do wait. And if, 
if so much time goes by and they finally say, you know, this has been here for two months, it's not healing on its own, I want to do something. They don't have electricity in these villages. The The water is all collected from rainfalls, no running water, mm. no wells. They do have, as I mentioned, boats. There'd be boats coming and going. What they'll do is they'll take a little bit of the battery acid from the battery on the, <laughs> the boat and they'll dab it around the area of the ulcer. Wow. And that local destruction actually results in the healing, right? So, the, what, what's the initial reaction? What? What? <laughs> you're, Zooks, you're, dab, man, what you're, are dab, you doing? you're dabbing. You know, so that, that's one. <laughs> Another approach is they'll take their machete, right? We mentioned this man has a machete. Yes, I and understand. they will heat. Will they heat yes. the end of the machete? <sighs> and they'll use, shall we call it, thermotherapy? <laughs> they'll, <laughs> thermotherapy. They'll take the hot. Scarification. They'll take the hot <laughs> machete. It. You know, and here would be the thing. Not blistering, burning, scalding hot, but a warm, heated machete, and they'll put that over the wound, and they'll do that a couple times a week for a few weeks, and guess what? It goes away. It heals. Mm. Another thing they'll do is they have different plants in different areas. So sometimes it'll be the outer covering of a cashew um, (laughs) nut, or it'll be certain plants that have similar properties like poison ivy, and they'll, they'll rub that on the area around it, and then when they get the blistering response, again, it'll mm. get resolution. Cool. So you hear these things, you know, what, what are these people? And now the interesting, well, what do, what do we do? What are Western, you know, the Western medicine recommendations? So thermotherapy, right. when I was down in Peru, there was a clinic I was, mm. I was at where we'd see 20 plus people a day. So you had a really good experience with leishmaniasis. And they would, they had a water bath that would heat to 50 C mm. and they would heat up these sort of pouches that they would clean. And then they would put the pouch on the area twice a week for a few weeks. And I'm like thinking, this is kind of like the machete, mm. except maybe a little bit more controlled on temperature. Mm. Or they would take li- liquid nitrogen and freeze yeah. the area all around. I'm thinking, this is kind of like the battery acid. I mean, so a lot of the <laughs> local destructive techniques were. We're similar. Now, if you take these people and you send them to the government, the government has a program where they'll actually inject pentavalent antimonials into the area mm. around. That will cause it to heal. But they do it every day for 18 to 21 days. It's incredibly painful. So in most cases, the people say, I'm going to kind of go with one of my <laughs> traditional approaches. So. so I have a question with regards to all of this. That is, none of these treatments are rapid. True. So that means that these people are potentially transmitters of the infection during the interim time when the treatment is not being administered. The lesion comes back to where it was, although it's diminished, but it's still there. It still has live organisms. Sandflies can acquire them. That's too bad because if you don't cover it over so that they can't get to it, Mm -hmm. and that's going to be impossible in a tropical situation like this, then Mm -hmm. you still have as much transmission during treatment as you did prior to starting the treatment. So the epidemiology of this is a little bit Mm -hmm. depressing to realize. It's too bad. But So is there no, like, Vaseline or some kind of an impervious material that doesn't do any harm, Uh, like, say, um, not battery acid? (laughs) Yes. But, you know, like uh, grease that you would grease a car with even, that you could smear all over this thing to prevent the sand fly from going through and grabbing a, a meal from the edge of that thing. Yeah, in no, the that's meantime. interesting. Yeah, from a control point yeah, of view, exactly. saying, okay, we have, we may have the patient. And I remember there was a hmm. issue when I was in India where there had been a patient that had come in with this um, post Kala Azar dermal leishmaniasis, right? Mm-hmm. And the concern there is this is a form of leishmaniasis where the skin is really mm-hmm. just, shall I use the word, teeming with teeming. Leish, leishmania. And word. when the sand, any sand fly bites this person anywhere, now you've, mm-hmm. and that's th- right. these, are sort of the super spreader nidises in a in a control yeah. program problem. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, this is interesting, and you know you don't want to cover the wound. It's not the ulcer you're worried about. It's the area around exactly, where the sand flies right. right. No, exactly, so you'd have right. to whatever barrier you're putting over sure. this once you identify it. That's right. Um, yeah, no, this is these are really important control issues. And then as we mentioned, it's not just in the people, right? I was mentioning there's a dog where we're trying to treat with topical azoles, and he's getting bitten. And then yeah, there are animal reservoirs. It, it has yeah. complications. It's, it's a very, that's why it's still here. One of the reasons, yes. All right. Now, one of the challenges. So, what did you do, Daniel? Yeah, what did you do? <laughs> um, no, so in in this case, we you know had been there for about a month, and he was happy, basically seeing how it did over the next. So, when they go back the next mm-hmm. time, you know, he will have either used a local remedy. Now they sort of had identified what it is, 
or he may go to, and again, this is stuff, he may potentially consider going to the government for treatment. And again, how does he do that? It's hours by boat. Yeah, he yeah. would have to, it's, it's really, there's a lot of barriers in this case. Uh, All right. All right. Well, we had 12 guesses, and I'm going to pull a random number out of the hat. The number Drum is, is not, number four. Number four. Number four is Eric from UCLA. Eric, send your address to twip at microbe.tv, and we shall send you a fresh copy of PD6. Indeed. Is With that our correct? pleasure. Is that and correct? It. We both did you did you get number four right? Like, see, oh yeah, because yeah, we had the people up front who, yeah. okay, yeah, I see. Because yeah. we had people up front yep. commenting about you guys reviewing their paper. Dixon, someone sent in Dixon. someone. I see this. Who they wanted to be a hero, but uh, Miriam Rothschild. Do you know Miriam Rothschild? Well, isn't she the woman that I was referring to before that studied fleas? Yes. And that's the one. Yeah. She's a flea person. She died. Uh, yeah, that's in January of 2005. 2005. I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. We've had a recent uh, passing also of a well known and highly respected parasitologist, uh, Ruth Nussenzweig, who died on April 1st of this year and who was widely respected and known for her work in malaria and uh, developing vaccines and interested in uh, the molecular biology of, of the parasites. So we should probably feature her life. Uh, in one of our uh, tributes to heroes as well. I think she would be a worthy addition to the book. I would agree. I, I would agree. That's, that's actually a pretty impressive family. The no, I would, I would totally agree. Do you want to have this young lady, Miriam Rothschild, or do you want to pick your own? Well, you know, I, I, I admire, we, we could, there's no harm in doing that. We have some blank pages that we could um, certainly fill with, um, Interesting and um, admired people, and so, certainly so, uh, Marion Rothschild was a member of the Rothschild family. I might tell us a little bit, bit about <clears throat> Marion Rothschild. Well, I don't know enough about her to be honest. I, I just knew it from our classes that I had here in medical entomology. When it came to fleas, they said, and there's this very famous woman who made elegant drawings and uh, actually got into the photography aspect of it also to. Uh, capture as yeah, many images of different species of fleas as you could get her hands on. She did a six-volume catalog of 30,000 flea specimens. <laughs> exactly. She discovered how fleas jump. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> right. That's right. And it's not a circus act either. <laughs> yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> she, she received no education until she was 17 when she demanded to go to school. <laughs> right. Right. Wow. So she grew up in the UK, of course. And um, so, well, some of the Rothschilds lived in France too, I think. Yeah, and she was a member of the famous Rothschild exactly. clan. Exactly, a lot as of those say. a lot of those people, unfortunately, uh, during the Second World War, were sequestered by the Germans and uh, sent yeah. to concentration camps or killed Says because here, they were Jewish. And she, uh, she worked sixteen-hour days studying trematodes until a German bomb destroyed all traces of her research. Look at uh, she's lucky it didn't destroy her. Yeah, that actually there was a bomb that actually oh, destroyed a worked, wing of the British Museum. She worked with Alan Turing. Oh, how interesting. On breaking Enigma. How very interesting. I didn't know that. Wow. And she wrote a book called Fleas, Flukes, and Cuckoos, a study of bird parasites. <gasps> Crazy. She used high speed photography to study how fleas jumped. There you go. Fascinating stuff. The cuckoo is a parasitic I bird. Think, I think it's Deserving of well, let's do it. Here, absolutely, Doctor. You bet. You, I would be happy to uh, review her history on the air. I thought it was entertaining that she felt that people misunderstood the flea. I don't think enough people think about fleas <laughs> to misunderstand. Them. Well, <laughs> they're all obligate uh, intermittent parasites of uh, various sorts. They they all require blood meals for their food. Uh huh. And uh, a lot of them spread parasites of various kinds in, in the plague, for instance, and things like this. So I think they're, they're incredibly important in terms of understanding history. And their natural history plays into that quite a bit. And I think perhaps that's where she got her inspiration. Yeah. Uh, they have an interesting life cycle, too. I mean, I think no one considers what happens to flea eggs, <laughs> what a flea larva is. And then okay. where do they end up? They end up in a pile of dust. And they hatch based on vibrations that they feel. 
So a, a house that's been flea infested, like say um, a rental home, mm-hmm. and I've heard these stories, of course. And the, the 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 owners that stayed there in the summer had a dog, and the dog had fleas, and the fleas kept multiplying like crazy and bothering the dog and sometimes the people, but mostly the dog because the dog was their primary host. And then the family vacated the house for the winter and rented it to somebody else the next spring. And son of a gun, if those flea larvae that had now developed into pupae would sit and sit and sit and wait and wait until they felt the vibrations on the floor. And the moment they did, they hatched and Mm. attacked the next victim. (laughs) Yeah. It's really quite interesting stuff. All right, Dixon, you picked the paper. I did, but you know, I have to... called Oecologia. May I refresh my screen because I don't have the actual reference here on I, this? I could, while you're refreshing, I oh, could... you have the paper. I have the paper here. Oh, great. Non-native parasite enhances susceptibility of host to native predators. So you don't have the paper, is that what you're saying? It's not on my screen, I don't. I'm um, so sorry. But I sorry. can take Daniel's Can you take Daniel's? Leads. Yes. Because I, I could, would like to summarize we'll, this we'll paper. We'll pass it back and forth. And I'm going to try to I'm gonna try to contribute a little bit more so that should someone write in and thank us for reviewing <laughs> yeah. the paper, I want to be thanked <laughs> too. No, he gets my thanks for <laughs> printing it. That's, I should have done that to begin with, but I thought I could yeah. conjure it up here. Nonetheless, the re- I, I actually selected this paper because I was searching for something – out of the ordinary that we could review, which would involve ecology as well as parasitism. And this um, is published in a journal called Ecologica. It's a O-E-C-O-L-O-G-I-A, Ecologica. And it's a very famous journal, and it's a widely read journal by ecologists. And this is highlighted student research, by the way. This is not from your tenured faculty uh, position at some large ecological study unit. This is uh, two authors, um, Alyssa Lois Gimmon and James E. Byers. Where are they from, Dixon? Well, they're from a very famous place, however. They're from the Eugene Odom School of Ecology at the University of Georgia. Wow. This is probably the epicenter for modern ecology. Hmm. And um, Eugene Odom was a genius at uh, defining what are the things that are needed to understand how nature works? And he spawned an enormous number of highly competent and, and gifted and talented researchers in the field of ecology and used all of the available resources he could, including effluent from nuclear power plants and <laughs> the fact that he was located close to the shore of the Atlantic Ocean where they have a lot of barrier islands where they could study the Spartina which is the grass that forms the food base for the rest of the uh, animals and plants that live along those same places. And this this sort of plays into that ocean uh, estuarian type of ecology because these two students have elected to study the, the effects of an invading non-native parasite, in this case a parasitic barnacle. A which, castrating barnacle. A castrating barnacle, which has a host selectivity of mud crabs. And mud crabs are, turns out to be the favorite food of blue claw crabs. Mm-hmm. And blue claw crabs are, everybody knows them because those are the ones that are commonly um, fish for over bridges with nets and little heads of fish in the net. And you pull them up every now and then and you got a blue claw crab and you get a whole basket full and you take them home and you boil them up and eat them. And, um, you wonder how blue claw crabs make their living, basically, in the estuaries and in the um, the salt marshes. And they, they do so by predating on mud crabs, mm. which I had not known. So this paper explores the possibility of an introduced new parasite, which infects mud crabs. And I'll give you the name of that parasite. Uh, first of all, let me give you the name of the mud crab. It's Uri Panopius depressus. <laughs> <laughs> right? They have interesting names. The predatory blue claw crab is Calinectes sapidus. And the parasites that are um, in discussion here are uh, Loxothalus panopia. Loxothalicus. Thilicus. Loxothalicus. Loxothilicus. That's that's absolutely right. Loxothilicus panopy, uh, referring to the fact that it it actually um, 
well, <coughs> being a barnacle parasite means it sticks to the outside of the. That's brain. right, exactly right. And how does it harm it? Well, in this case, it actually interferes with the breathing mechanism of the frog of the uh, crab, crab in order to obtain hmm. um, oxygen from the wow. surrounding ocean. It, it blocks their uh, ability to take in water. But it's interesting in that it actually makes them faster. Well, we we're going to get to that. Oh, we're going to get to that. Let's, <laughs> let's, because let's, I think not, when you initially yeah. think, like, oh, the poor compromised crab, it can barely breathe. But. No, no, you have it, of course. But let's let's discuss their observations. And this this was a carefully constructed, wonderfully simplistic, but very definitive way of looking at host-parasite relationships. And I thought it would make a great example to other students listening as to what's possible with, I would consider this to be bare minimum molecular biological resources mm. available. Yeah. These people have to be able to identify two kinds of crabs and two kinds of barnacles, the non-parasitic as well as the parasitic barnacles. Then they devised a series of experiments to explore the way these parasites are transmitted from host to host and the effect of the non-infected group of mud crabs that might benefit or not from this parasitic relationship. So they have these wonderful topic headings, and I'm, I feel like um, – Mayor LaGuardia now reading the comics on Sunday to the kids. Now, the first thing in the <laughs> materials and methods is, is a very nice description of both of the um, predator crab and the and the uh, the victim crab, and also the parasites. So they start out by asking this question: Do predatory crabs preferentially consume infected hosts over uninfected hosts? And they're going to do this using... What's a mesocosm? Well, that's what I was going to talk about now. They're going to use two different ways of studying this problem. They're going to use a mesocosm approach first, mm -hmm. and that's trying to replicate some aspects of the outdoor environment in an indoor laboratory setting, Got but it. which is an open-ended kind of um, a situation. In this case, they actually pumped in um, estuary and water from the surrounding uh, environment through some tanks into which they put empty mussel shells, mm -hmm. which is how the mud crab evades predation from the lucro crab. Or they, oyster, right? These are bleached bleached oysters oyster shells. or oysters, yeah. one of those two things. And then they, they introduced both infected and uninfected mud crabs in certain percentages, 50-50 mm -hmm. in some cases. And then they introduced a single blue claw crab predator. <laughs> and the next morning they came back and they – captured all the crabs, and they enumerated them, and they did this repeatedly until they found out uh, whether there was a preferential uh, predation. And indeed, they found out that blue claw crabs, would you say prefer? I don't think they have consciousness about this thing, <laughs> but they certainly ate more in, in infected mud crabs than yeah. they did non-infected Three mud times crabs. more. And the, and the interesting part about the study also was that they claimed it was very easy to tell the difference between the infected mud crab and the uninfected mud crab because the barnacle produces a little spike of uh, identification, almost like a flag yeah. that sticks up out of the infected crab and says, I'm over here. Now, they, they said that this doesn't occur right away. So some of the, quotes, unquote, uninfected crabs could have also been infected crabs, but they mm. couldn't tell because the barnacle hadn't developed. come up yeah. with a spike yet, right? So they... <laughs> So they had, a, they had a little bit of a problem there, but the statistics bore out all of their, their results. And they I think used, they make the comment, if anything, this underestimates the effect. Exactly, exactly, right? exactly. So exactly. the number was 120 infected hosts were consumed yeah. and 36 uninfected crabs. Exactly. So they have a good number. Yeah. That's, Boy, that, that crab had a day, <laughs> field day, didn't it? <laughs> that's a, that became a very large crab eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the second question they asked then – was do predators preferentially consume infected hosts over uninfected hosts? Now they wanted a field study to back up the mesocosm. Mm -hmm. So here, they, I think this is fabulous. I, I just loved reading this part because I said, how the hell are we going to keep track of all these mud crabs, right? So they have to have infected and uninfected mud crabs on equal amounts. They're going to go into nature and look for the answer. So they devised a very interesting system that involved a PC – P pipe or PCV pipe, whether it's a plastic PVC, PVC pipe, well, polyvinyl we'll chloride pipe, <laughs> onto which was crazy glued monofilament fishing line. Mm -hmm. And each fishing line 
tendril, as you wanted to think about it, was then glued onto the carapace of either an infected or an uninfected mud crab. Right, right. So they had a, like a family of mud. It looked like a maypole of mud crabs. And they, they stuck these down into the mud during low tide. At low tide, okay. And then yeah. they could observe the mud crabs sort of dispersing along their tethers. Couldn't go very far, Couldn't though. Couldn't go yeah. so far, not so far. They, these were, you know, meters long in terms of the length of yeah. these tethers. And then they waited for the tide to come in. They came back the next morning. <laughs> so the assumption is that the blue claws are going to come in and exactly. chop exactly. them up. Right? Yeah, and then which ones did they prefer, the infected or the uninfected? Infected. So they lifted the darn things up, brought them back into the lab, and they said, you know, we can tell whether or not this was a, a mud crab that molted or a mud crab that was actually killed and eaten mm -hmm. because the eye stalks are still there on the mud I crabs. The, I don't get that. Why the, would you, you – if it molted, well, you would lose all the legs because they have No, not picture. the legs. The eye I, – the I, this picture of an eaten crab, there are no legs left. No, that's, that's an eaten crab. <laughs> but eaten if it legs. had molted, yeah. not only would the legs be there, but the eye stalks would not be there. So if it molted, the legs would be there? Yeah, because it has to crawl out of its old legs because it's making room for new legs. So but it takes it, its eye. I know, with but it. The, if it's got no legs, it's got to be eaten. So what's that's, the, that's what? correct. No, I did say that. <laughs> okay. I did say that. I but if it. they found a carapace with with no eye stalks, okay, that's a molt. Yeah, if but they that found would have one legs. with a, with eye stalks. They ate the legs and then they didn't eat the eyes. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So it's what they very, found is they still preferred. The infected mud crabs. How do we there. know that the blue claws are eating these guys and not something else? Well, that's their favorite food, and the whole place was loaded with blue claw crabs. Seems like an assumption. Just assumed, Seems like an assumption. They're going to make an assumption on this one, but it's a pretty good assumption, actually. <laughs> I I would, that's, I, but I think that's fair, right? You know, yeah, you we, we don't, you know, some other some, fish, something else could be eaten them in there. Come on I don't know. In my field, we can't make such assumptions. Yeah, well, right? that's true. But remember, this is a student study with very, very basic equipment. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But they didn't get a different answer in this case, at least. And so then they had another question to ask. Not your paperback. But paperback. No, I, I think that's a good, you know, I think that's a good sort of comment. How do we know that that's, you know, and so at least you want sort of a comment that this is the only or predator in this mm. right. little localized field. Because, you know, they are showing that these barnacleized, parasitized uh, mud crabs are more likely to be consumed. Sure, sure. We th suspect it's this but we're not watching it. I guess you get in there and get some visual. Yeah, and watch but you know, it's it. kind of a murky water situation when the tides come in. And oh, see, so the other the thing estuaries. is, Dixon, you're tying these guys down. What you kind are. of chance do they you have? Are. What if Wait a minute. The, the guys faster that were ones tied could... down that weren't infected were okay. But that was actually something they talked about too. So these tethers are about 30 centimeters long, yeah. and it gives them enough sort of scope, enough Freedom. range, they so that they away. can get in and hide. Okay. Right. And so, but then, no, that is, because does that change behavior? Remember, we used to like, well, remember we used to, we used to, people tag animals. Yeah. And then some of the things we've realized is you start tagging animals and that impacts behavior. So particularly the uh, yeah, studies on yeah. penguins, for instance, <laughs> um, you know, again, you, when you start interfering with this, is that's why it's nice. I think that they have the two systems. They have the me that's, mesocosm that's where exactly right. they're really just putting them there. And then, you know, so I think it complements. Yes. Um, because yeah, I'm that's sure, right. I'm sure crazy glue and string and tie in a mud crab to a PVC as some, <laughs> I'm assuming there's an impact here. No, it sounds, it sounds like a great, <laughs> Great experiment. It's, it sounds almost like a science fair project, though. The, but but it takes it to the graduate level. Ecologists, by the way, are prone not to try to disturb the environment. They're yeah, observers of, of the environment. They don't want to disturb it. But this is a different kind of but study. You know what Schrodinger said: you can't <laughs> disturb by looking. You're disturbing. Correct. Right? What do they find? How do they measure speed? What do they do? I don't know. Wait a minute. So then they they have to sit down and they have to discuss now. Why are the parasitized crabs okay. more predated than the normal crabs? The I'm glad they I like. I'm glad oh, they asked that? this question. This is why great. did they? Why? And they should have a video, right? Is there a video? I would love to watch <laughs> I, this. Right? I, I, I would like to hear the conversation between <laughs> these two people because they said, "Well, we know that they eat infected crabs, but now are they are they eating them because the crabs are slower?" Are the faster? Maybe there's some behavioral change that this parasite induces that we can measure, that we can account for the difference by looking for this behavioral change. And their guess was it was just the opposite of what they found, right? They said, here's the heading of it. It says, do infected hosts move slower than uninfected hosts? 
I don't think that was the way to phrase this, to be honest with you. The way to phrase this that is neutral is, yeah, yeah, yeah. is there a movement difference between totally. infected and uninfected? Yeah, you're brain? biasing your hypothesis. You're exactly yeah. right. Yeah, you're so, right. because they got a big surprise at the end of this, right? Yeah. And so Daniel let the Schrodinger's cat out of the bag. So why don't you continue on with the discussion? Well, I think it's, I think <laughs> this is, you know, my favorite part of the experiment. <laughs> so apparently you've got these, uh, these mud crabs, and they're running down two different length runways. There's a short and a long runway. <laughs> and apparently, the infected parasitoses are twice as fast. That's right. <laughs> this is a crab run experiment. Crab they're, run. They're, they're, with the run. they're running running inside. Uh, there's this PVC tube that they're using exactly. for this And they put them in the runway. middle, right? So they're they really using a lot direction. of PVC. I mean, they're really using their resources <laughs> here. This is true. So <laughs> the other thing is that they claim that putting this infected or uninfected crab a mud crab in the middle of the pipe imitated when they picked them up, what would it might happen if a blue claw crab picked it up? Mm-hmm. So they're already panicked. Mm-hmm. These crabs are at their height of panic and they put them down in the pipe and let them go and see which way. It doesn't matter which way they go. And they recorded it by film, right? So mm-hmm. it would have been, this is probably clear PVC. Is there such a thing? Yeah, sure. Okay. So then they're actually <laughs> sure. recording speed of movement in either direction after they put them in the middle of these pipes. Yeah. And lo and behold, what did they find, Daniel? They found that the uh, parasitized crabs were twice as fast. Twice, twice as, as fast. fast. Now, wait a minute. What sense does this make? How could a blue claw crab prefer a faster prey cut than half. a slower prey? The tube was cut in half. That's how they could see it. Oh, okay, fine. So the point is that I'm trying to envision how this blue claw crab views its food. In other words, I'm thinking that there's an analogy here between San Diego runners that like to run five miles before dinner and mountain lions. Mm -hmm. So mountain lions, they won't chase you if you don't run. They will just sit and look at you. They want to chase their food. So then they always attack attack from behind. Mm -hmm. And so they attack deer like this and they eat a lot of deer. That's their favorite food because deer, they can smell the mountain lion and they run like hell, but they can't outrun them. So here we've got we've got a crab species that's a little bit like a mountain lion that says, you know, I just hate slow prey food. I just don't like slow food. It's okay, fine. so Alice Waters would I like be very fast food. This she would what's... be extremely offended by this crab because this is fast food. Oh, that's the okay. title of our episode. Fast food. Fast food, not slow food, wins the day. Fast food will kill you. That's exactly <laughs> Particularly right. so, if you're a crab. So here's this blue claw crab killer waiting for somebody to make a false move. And this parasite mm. obviously affects the behavior of the mud crab in a way that makes it run faster or crawl faster. And as a result, it attracts the attention of the crab and away he goes and zags. He, he nails it. I think that's the interesting part, that it makes it run faster. That I would love to yes. in- inspect, right? Exactly right. <laughs> well, I, maybe it's-, it's also interesting why. Why would a castrating, parasitizing yeah, barnacle question. make you run fast, right? Correct. It's a right. great question. I don't know. Well, but, but we do have some speculation afterwards, now that the results are solidly established. Mm. This is evidence-based research at its best. We have a fast prey. We have a faster predator. Mm-hmm. And we have a bunch of uninfected mud crabs and a bunch of infected mud crabs. So question, does predation of the infected group of mud crabs spare the uninfected mud crabs by reducing the parasite load yeah. through predation of a predator? And that's a fascinating question it that is. I have, you know, I've never thought about this before, to be honest. I've, I, you know, I work yeah. on mammalian parasites and like trichinella and things like this. You wouldn't run across that kind of a situation in that, that mm-hmm. regard. Mm-hmm. But outdoors in an ecological situation where you've got all of nature behaving in front of you, I think this is a fabulous study because it allows you to think about how nature really does behave. And that, that's the reason why I was attracted yeah, to this. I think it's interesting because it's not behaving the way you would common sense it would make you think, to right? do with intuition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we think like, right. oh, okay, so, you know, we, we think of the predator, you know, a feline predator, and all that, maybe a lot of our sort of mental pictures of, and you've got the the hoofed animals, maybe they're antelope or something like that, herb animal. <laughs> right. And then what gets taken down by the wolves or the yeah, leopard, that's right, or that's right, that's it's right. going to be the slowest, and, and it's slow because it's sickly. Well, the disease, it's got is, some that's right, exactly. Disease. But here you have a disease that makes you faster. 
That's it. But you still can't outrun the blue claw crab. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, no matter you're, how far you're, you you're run. fast enough to get its attention, but not fast enough to get away. That's right. And that's like the story where the guy's putting on his running sneakers, and the guy's like, you can't outrun that bear. He's like, I have to outrun the bear, just that's you. That's correct. So, <laughs> no, we're, we're, the, but here you're running too fast. The, the, you're getting the attention. But it, it's the, the common sense would be the diseased ones get eaten because they can't get away. They're slow. They're disadvantaged. But here suddenly they're faster, but that's what kills them. The tag of the bear story is that the bear ate the guy that didn't have the sneakers first and then caught the guy with the sneakers. <laughs> caught the other guy. <laughs> right. So there's a complication here, though. Tell us. Which is that in studies of estuaries, yeah. there's a positive, it's been found that there's a positive relationship between predator abundance and infection prevalence. Okay. So, in other words, the more predators, the more infected crabs you see in the wild they could they could spread it by simply ingesting their prey well that was something and they, they talked about this yeah, too. they, they talked about whether uh, here's what happens the, 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 blue claws, the, the, blue claws, the blue claws don't get the parasite when they eat no they them. don't no right. they don't only the mud crabs get yeah, so it, but, here you wouldn't really s- expect predation spread no you wouldn't but there's no. an issue here too and that is you have to think about the life cycle of all of these animals right so the life cycle of the crabs mm. the, nobody well, I don't want to say nobody. I think the, the commercial fisherman for blue claw crab is painfully aware of the situation. It requires a clean environment, requires an estuary that functions. And then what happens when the crabs mate and they lay their eggs and the larvae hatch? Mm-hmm. Where do they go? And they become pelagic. Now, we have a colleague. Open waters? Yeah. We, I, I questioned one of our colleagues and I said, have you ever heard the term pelagic before? And she said, No. And I said, would you like to know what it means? She said, of course. I said, it's the same thing as oceanic, right? It occurs in the open ocean. So these larvae are washed out to sea, Mm -hmm. and they develop until they can finally come down to the bottom. And then the question is, how do they find their way back to the estuary? And I think I know the answer. Mm -hmm. They do it by chemoattraction. It's a smell thing, just like salmon find their way back into rivers. So imagine what's happening now. All over the eastern seaboard of the United States, the estuaries are being polluted. You got agricultural runoff. You've got agrochemicals. You've got all kinds of encroachment situations. You've got urbanization. You've got byproducts from lawnmowers and gas stations and everything else washing down into the ocean, confusing the hell out of these poor larval organisms that have a difficult time finding their way back to where they were born. Right. And now you've got the introduction of another species through the oyster industry. This was inadvertent. They didn't mean to do it, but they had to move their oyster industry from the north to the south because the the Chesapeake Bay and places like that have become unacceptable habitats for raising these animals. And so now you've got huge ecological disturbances. That's basically what I want to Mm -hmm. say. So it was interesting. They had a program a long time ago on television about – uh, someone who's following the life story of John Muir. And in order to know more about John Muir, this person wanted to interview Eugene Odom mm-hmm. to find out what he knew about <laughs> John Muir. Mm-hmm. So he actually on motorcycle, this was a gun motorcycle, he motorcycled all the way down to the University of Georgia, made an appointment with Eugene Odom, sat down and started to talk to him about all this disturbance and ecological stuff and why it was so sad that you couldn't do pristine ecology anymore. And Eugene Autumn looked right back at him and said, young man, do you think for one moment you can go anywhere on this planet and find something that hasn't been disturbed by humans? And the guy looked at him like, well, yeah, what about the high plateaus of the West? Or what about Antarctica? He says, no, no matter where you go, you're going to find human effects Mm -hmm. on life, wildlife. So here's my question to you, young man. Why aren't you studying the effects of humans and other disturbances on the wildlife. Why isn't that a legitimate ecological study? Why do you think you have to deal with pristine nature in order to get an answer? And the fact is that (laughs) you get more answers when you look at the effects of disturbance than you do because that's something that you didn't do yourself, right? Remember, ecologists like to look. They're sort of voyeurs, scientific voyeurs. Mm -hmm. They don't want to disturb their environments. They just want to observe how it behaves, which is why long-term ecological studies are so important. Get a PhD in ecology, very difficult. Get a PhD in molecular biology, you can do 20-minute experiments 
until you're blue in the face. You can develop an entire wall of, of is it, plaque acid. Is it hard to get a job in ecology once you've got a PhD? Uh, well, there are lots of state jobs that no, relate to wildlife yeah. management and yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. So ecology, and, and then most universities have departments of ecology as well. And and companies hire ecologists, particularly right. lumber companies and, and mining companies. They want ecologists to tell the world that they're not doing any harm at all. That they're, Well, some of them do, but most of them want to know what not to do so they can behave in a more yeah, balanced way. I love this paper. It's a great paper. It. It's fun, yeah. I, there's a part here that I want to tell people about, which I thought was amusing. They're um, gluing this oh, wire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This wire, onto, this uh, fishing line onto the crabs, and they say, the, the tether was glued with lock light super glue. Glue was allowed to dry for five minutes. That's right. To assure that the crabs were satisfactorily attached, they were kept for 24 hours in the flow through system prior to placement in the field. So we don't want to lose our. No, yeah. That was in the recovery room. They put them in the recovery room. <laughs> That's right. That's great. It's a lot of fun. And it went pretty well. They didn't, they were well glued. They were well, they were well glued. And none of the tethers came off of the PVC pipe either. So I think that's what is a clever, that's a clever approach. If Eugene Odom were still alive, he'd like that. He would have given them a standing ovation. Very good. Absolutely. Dixon. Uh, I have a hero to read too. We had a hero. We had Miriam. We had Miriam. Let's, let's focus on Miriam. You want to do Miriam? Okay, fine. fine. I asked you before you said yes. No, I didn't. (laughs) Vincent. What? I didn't read it. You read excerpts from the thing and we contributed, right? We all, we all contributed. Gotta be next fun. time it can be all just you. Daniel. No, no, I wasn't saying, you can read this next one. I don't care. Do you have a new case for us, Dan? I do. Does, I do. Is this from Panama? And can people guess? Where do you think it is? Where do you think? Yes. From northern Stick, or southern? Sticking with our theme. You know what I'm going to do? Is I'm going to do this kind of the way I presented the other. So we're we're going to take the readers with, with us on this. They're oh, going to go to this remote. So first we're going to fly down to Panama City. Mm-hmm. We're flying to the international airport, and we're going to switch to the domestic airport, which is over by the canal, right? The canal in Panama, and then we're going to fly another hour. We're going to go right up to the Costa Rican border. Cool. And we're going to come to this little town of Bocas del Toro. Now we're going to travel a little bit by boat out to the base, and now we're going to travel two and a half hours in an open boat across the Are water. Are we there yet? We're not there yet. <laughs> we're we're soaking wet at this point. My underwear is <laughs> wet. I don't like wet underwear. I'm going to bring dry underwear in a plastic a bag next to time. <laughs> but now we go up this, we go up this little, and this is, I have to say, this is beautiful. We go up this um, stream through the mangroves. Oh, that's, that is and, nice. And uh, nice. there's caimans. Oh, yeah. There's caimans in there. Oh, yeah. And there's beautiful, beautiful birds. And, and actually, I have to say <clears throat> that later when we go out in the evening, we're going to see the um, the dolphins playing mm-hmm. in, in the uh, ocean there. It's a spectacular area. It's an area where there's howler monkeys in the trees. Um, there are um, sloths. Sloths. Lots. I mean, this is so. So here, so you now we, snakes? so now we get off. We get. There's actually sort of this rickety dock, and and the boat that we're in, just to describe it a little better, is a huge tree that basically has been cut in half and <laughs> hollowed out. So there's a lot of bailing and a lot of wetness going on. Wow. Um, again, why my underwear is wet? Why all? Because <laughs> we're all going together. So we're all all our underwear is wet. Now we go and we've got a medical mobile medical clinic set up in this little village that is on this island in the archipelago and the people are all um, in this no bay village. So it's indigenous villagers. Um, and a family is going to see us. Um, later on, we may learn a little bit about the mother in mm-hmm. a future case, just mm-hmm. as a warning. Wow. Um, and uh, the, the mother is seeing us because she's concerned about her two children. And what she tells us is that these two children have a very itchy rash on several parts of their body including the trunk and arms. The itchiness is worse every night. Um, she would like some medicine for this. Um, we see the, we're going to see the first boy. We're going to focus on one of them here. And this first boy is six years old, and he shows us in the rash in many areas of body, including the genital area, his buttocks, his arms, his thorax. He was a little bit hesitant to show us the rash in the, in the genital area, as you might imagine. But we sort of negotiate with the mom. We agree. A friend of mine brought these balls down there. We're like, listen, it's important for us to see. If you let us look, then my friend here is going to give you a ball. And then mm. finally, eventually, my friend gives him a ball. But anyway, we were able to get a good exam. And this is important to figure out what's going on here. 
Um, you know, he's sick, so there's there's nothing sort of out of the ordinary as far as his medical history. There's no surgery. There's never been any medicine or allergy issues in the past. Um, now, just to give you a little bit more about his context, he's living in the same village that we saw that um, the boy with the machete um, who had the ulcer. This is an isolated pre- village. The previous case. Yeah, right. just the same village as the previous case. Um, so it's an isolated village with a few hundred people living there. They lives in one of those homes where the the slat floors and there's little gaps between them. Uh, the toilet is just an over the water toilet. So there's you go to sort of the edge and there's a hole and stuff just drops into the water. Occasionally people drop into the water. You want to be careful of that. Because of the uh, Cayman, I presume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm also thinking the other stuff. You don't want to drop in the water where the other stuff's dropping in exactly. the water. Um, there's dogs, there's pigs, there's chickens, there's no electricity. All the water is they're collecting it off the roofs. Right. We, we talked a little bit about like the first step of development here is somebody gets a tin roof and you can collect the rainwater better off the tin roof. Pretty soon, a few people get tin roofs, you have a little bit more drinking water. Um, Keeps you awake at night, though, if it rains. <laughs> yeah. And with, I guess, joy, it's raining and fresh <laughs> drinking true. water no, for the true. morning. That is true. Um, now... We're, we're, when we examine this boy, we see that um, there's there's a rash in all these areas that we described, and we're going to look closely, and we're going to see, and we're going to do a we're going to do dermoscopy again, right? So we see these areas where there's a little bit of redness. We can see where he's been scratching. Um, there's these little, I'm going to say about one centimeter long, brown lines, and there's little clotted blood dots at the end of a lot of these little areas and we do our dermoscopy we're going to see these um these brown areas right so these sort of dark lines and at the end of these dark lines are what looks like little deltas so these linear dark arrows and these little mini brown deltas on our dermoscope and uh you know i'll show i'm going to show dixon some of the, you want to describe that rash a little bit? So here I'm giving, he's putting on his reading glasses. And you see, yeah, so these are actually, this is going to be a close up photo. And then this is going to be our dermoscopic images, which I've labeled for you. Yeah. It doesn't look like a scratch scar. It looks like it was caused by something, if, if you had to ask me. Um, the rashes are really uh, on the border of becoming serious. And they they look as though they may, uh, if they scratch them enough, could become secondarily infected. That's yeah. the big worry there, I think. But it's interesting that uh, they've got, dare I say, serpiginicity. <laughs> pretty, they're pretty linear. I'm going to go with more of. A I mean, linear, on the right? buttocks. Oh yeah, on the buttocks. Yeah, but so you're going to see. You and know, then, that's a linear. That's a linear there. But I, yeah. I would like to look back over here. And I want to have my finger over this so you can't see, but there's these little chevrons, these little brown triangles, which I think are interesting. And, you know, people who are not right. familiar may do a little Googling research. So um, hmm. I think that's what I'm going to give you. Okay. That's it. Very itchy, worse at night, all these areas. We've got this dermoscopic information to add to our, but well, that's all I've given you. But maybe Dixon, you have some more questions you want to throw at me? You're feeling pretty good about this. How old is this kid? He is six years old. And the other one, too. And the other's a few years younger. The other's four, I think. And has the same kind of... Has the same kind of rash, very similar distribution. Yeah. And this is the only family that has this? I have to say, in this area, about a fifth of the kids have this. Yeah, this I, is quite common. I was particular. And they See, live among animals and birds and yeah. lots of different things. Right? Yeah, and, and I should say, it's interesting. You go to certain you go to certain villages, and there's high rates of this particular mm-hmm. issue. Got it. On Sorry. kids, not on adults, though, right? Mainly the kids. Yeah. Mainly the kids. Mainly the kids. Mainly the kids. All right. There you go. Thank you, Daniel. All right. Twip 150. That's a good number, right? It is. When we get to 200, we'll do, we'll do something special. We'll have a party. Special. Twip 150, you can find it at microbe.tv slash twip. And you can find it on your smartphone and your tablet. Just Use your typical podcast player and search for us, and you'll find it. Subscribe. If you like what we do, give us your contributions at microbe.tv slash contribute, and send your emails and case guesses to twip at microbe.tv. We have a bunch of emails backlog. We have to get to those sometime. We can do a show just on those sometime if you'd like. What do you think? Uh, it's always okay with me. 
Maybe can, throw in an extra case just to keep it so honest. We could do a case in emails maybe next time. How's there's that? So many, but there's so many great articles to discuss. Yeah, I know. I, I actually had another. Well, we have to yeah. do a daily twip. That's it. We, really? We've got we've to make it. Or we <laughs> need, to be, in need to be a little bit better about this week aspect of our show. Uh, that's true. <laughs> this time in Paris. This time, yeah, that's a good one. They would still be... It wouldn't would be TWIP then. That's the problem. Ah, you're right. Daniel Griffin is at CUMC and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Good to see you. Pleasure as always. Dixon DePomier is at Trichinella.org and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Dixon. And thank you very much, Vincent. And I must uh, caution our audiences that, in a good way, that we're reviving the this uh, the Parasite page on Trichinella. Trichinella.org so. is now visible. It's visible. You can check out the history. We fixed sections. it a little bit. And, and uh, we're working we'll on it. We'll get better. It. We're giving it artificial respiration. Yeah, we should work on that again. We should. Yes, let's That's do it true. soon. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Our thanks to Ronald Jenkins for his music on TWIP, ronaldjenkins.com and ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP. It's, it's parasitic. parasitic.